thanks for joining us again on another one of our uh, Safer at Home series talks. So great to have you with us. Um, don't don't worry, people. Spring is in the air. We can we can feel it. Um, <laughs> Uh, before we get started tonight, a um, couple things. We want to thank our sponsors for all these talks, um, Cape Cod 5, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, Martha's Vineyard Savings. want to remind you that all the books that are, um, that are part of our, our talk are available at 8 Cousins Bookseller in, um, in Falmouth. So we hope you uh, uh, participate in the, in the local economy. Um, um, uh, Quick uh, thing for you, if you're if you're new to the programs, if you would, if you make sure that you mute yourself so we can uh, we can hear our speaker and you know uninterrupted. If we have questions, we use the chat button down at down at the uh, bottom. Uh, we'll ask those at the end, and um, so uh, we want to make sure that our guest is. Uh, uh, is allowed to talk, and our guest today is coming from uh, uh, coming to us from Seattle. So the beauty of uh, Zoom lets him lets him stay in the in the great Pacific Northwest and, and talk to us from Seattle. Uh, Steve Olson, uh, this is not his first book. He's also written about Mount St. Helens. He's also uh, written about um, mapping human history. Um, he is a uh, consultant writer for the National Academy of Sciences, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and other scientific organizations. Uh, Steve Olson is the author of the, of the Apocalypse Factory, and he comes to us from Washington State. As I mentioned, would you welcome our guest tonight, Steve Olson? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. It's great to be here. Um, it is a beautiful day out here in Seattle, and, you know, I live in Seattle now, but uh, I know... Uh, I know your part of the world well. My wife is from Connecticut, and uh, we used to spend a lot of time on the Cape. She spent her childhoods on the Cape, and we used to go there for a long time. I lived in Washington, D.C. until about 10 years ago when she got a job out here, and so we moved to Seattle. Although, actually, as I'll, I'll describe in a minute, I did grow up in Washington State, which is one of the reasons why I wrote this book. Uh, as was mentioned, I, I uh, have worked for 42 years, actually, as a consultant writer and editor for the National Academy of Sciences. And most of you probably know that the National Academy of Sciences has a study center out on Woods Hole. And certainly some of my fondest memories are of committee meetings out there at Woods Hole. I remember back in 1986, I worked on a National Academy of Sciences committee uh, that released a report called Confronting AIDS. Uh, very important report of, the, of that period. And uh, a lot of that work was done out of Woods Hole. Uh, so uh, in describing this book, I'm going to run through a few slides uh, so that um, you can follow along with me. Let's make sure that I've got the right ones here. Yes, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. Let's see, this should work but it's deciding not to, and uh, so let's do that. There we go, that'll work. So at the uh, very end of the 19th century, a, uh, the, the museum in Washington, D.C. put together a, a panel of scholars and journalists and asked them to decide what were the most important stories of the 20th century. And here are the five uh, stories that were we're at the top of their list, uh, and you see that the number one story uh, was the, uh, the atomic bombing of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So, of course, what writer wouldn't want to write about that story? Now, perhaps I should have thought a little bit more carefully before starting this book about the number of other people who'd already written on these subjects, and therefore the number of books I was going to have to read to be able to write uh, knowledgeably about them. But uh, you know, writers are foolish and, and launch into these projects without thinking about things like that. Um, so, uh, but there's, you know, there, people have written a great deal about the development of the atomic bombs. Richard Rhodes' books are the most, uh, are the most well-known, but, but there are probably thousands of books out there that have been written about this subject. But, you know, I discovered that there was one part of this story that really hasn't been told very well, and uh, that was uh, a part that I had a personal connection to, as I'll describe in a minute. So I realized that there probably was another room for another book to describe some of these, some of these events that happened, uh, not, not for the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, but for the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. And that has to do with a place in South Central Washington State known as the Hanford Nuclear Research. 
So here's a map of Washington State that shows where the Hanford Nuclear Reservation is located. It's in a bend of the Columbia River. Um, here's a, a little more detailed map that shows this area. Uh, Hanford goes, let's see, I think I have the option of, uh, let's see how to do this. I actually haven't done this before of uh, doing some things with my cursor. Let's see. Yes, we'll see if that works. So oh, it does work a little bit. Okay, good. So I'm going to show you where Hanford is. It ex basically extends from this small town of Richland up along the Columbia River, up here to the Saddle Mountains, and uh, on this side of uh, Rattlesnake Mountains, and back down here. This is the, the Columbia River. This is an area that's uh, about half the size of the state of Rhode Island. It's about 30 miles from the town of Richland to the town of White Bluffs. I'll show you a little bit about what this country looks like. Uh, it's um, it's desert country. Oh, now I'm now I'm comp now now the situation is complicated by the fact that uh, the, the traces that I've drawn are going to continue to appear on some of these. So I may get rid of these a little bit later on, but we'll simply ignore them for now. Uh, the area gets about uh, oh six or eight inches of rain altogether, and uh, I'm going to see if I can clear this. But to be able to see these tiny little things. I'm going to have to, sorry about that. One of these little zoom things, that's a new thing that, uh, there it is. That's the thing I wanted. Got it. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a, a sort of a desert area. It's actually shrub step is what it's called. Uh, this area right here. Here's the bend of the Columbia River. Here's uh, actually one of the reactors is in the middle of this uh, photograph, uh, which is taken from what are called the White Bluffs. Uh, th this is taken from on this riverbank right here across from the old town of White Bluffs. And uh, one of the reactors was situated right where this uh, little farming town uh, was originally located. Now you'll notice on this map, uh, a, a, a town up here called Othello. That's actually the town that I grew up in, in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, you can actually see the roof of my house uh, from this uh, picture taken of the Othello Water Tower. It's a town of about 4,000 people. Uh, I didn't know it when I was growing up in the 1960s and 1970s because there's a large ridge right between Othello. This thing called the Saddle Mountains right here extends between Othello and Hanford. So you could not see Hanford from where we lived in Othello. But it turns out that Othello was the closest town uh, to Hanford of any other town, even the, the towns of uh, Richland, the far, small farming town of Richland, which was 30 miles to the south. Othello is just about 16 miles behind uh, the, the twin smokestacks that appear in this picture. This is actually the F reactor. There's the Columbia River and there are the White Bluffs behind the Columbia River, uh, which gave the town of White Bluffs its name. So, uh, when I started to learn a little bit more about Hanford, as I uh, considered uh, the possibility of writing a book about it or not, um, I had to ask myself whether this story had really been told much and discovered that it hadn't. And so that's the story that I set out to tell in this book. And that story starts in 1941 with this man, a chemist at the University of California, Berkeley named uh, Glenn Seaborg. Uh, at that time, he was a young, ambitious chemist, grew up in a small town in the Midwest, a really interesting person, uh, sort of found himself in the right place at the right time to play a very pivotal role in uh, the story of the making of the atomic bombs. In 1941, Seaborg was doing fundamental research on the, on the basic constituents of nature, uh, in, including uh, the, the heaviest atoms that are found in nature uh, and, and uranium. And what he discovered is that um, he could use uranium, the most common isotope of uranium, to make an element that had never uh, existed in the world before in, in any quantities. And here's how you do it. Uh, Seaborg discovered that if you take the most common isotope of uranium, which is called uranium-238, and you add a neutron to that isotope, what happens is you generate, uh, I'm sorry, you can't quite see this diagram very well, but uh, you generate an atom of what's called Neptunium-239. 
Now, Neptunium-239 turns out to be a radioactive isotope, which means that it is going to decay at some point into a different kind of atom. And Neptunium-239, as it turns out, uh, the, I know you can't see it probably because your pictures might get in the way of it, decays over the course of about a couple days into a new element, an element that I said hadn't been created before, which Seaborg and his colleagues who were working with him at the time uh, named plutonium. And the reason it's named plutonium is because uh, uh, uranium named after Uranus, the planet, Neptune, and then the next planet out at the time, uh, 1941, was Pluto. And so that's where the name plutonium came from. Now, even when Seaborg was doing this work in 1941, his work had already been classified top secret. And the reason was because people suspected that if it was possible to make this particular atom of plutonium-239, that it could be used to make atomic bombs. And what Seaborg discovered just a couple of weeks after he first isolated neptunium-239 is that not only could you use it to make atomic bombs, but it was, it's the best material in the, in the universe for making atomic bombs. Pound for pound, plutonium produces a, a larger explosion than any other atom. It's why we use plutonium today as the trigger in our nuclear weapons. But the situation in 1941 is that Seaborg had, had access to very few neutrons. It's very hard to make neutrons with the equipment that was available in 1941. He used a cyclotron at the University of California, Berkeley, where he was doing his work. But even with that, he could make just a, a very tiny quantity of plutonium atoms. I mean, not even enough to see in a microscope. He would detect those atoms by the radioactive signals that they gave off. So if he was going to make enough plutonium for, a, for an atomic bomb, uh, he was going to have to make much, much more plutonium. So that requires two things. You have to have uranium-238 atoms, but that's easy because you can just, uh, that's the most common isotope of uranium. You can just dig up uranium ore, and actually quite a bit of it was available in 1941. But you also need a source of neutrons. And uh, in 1941, um, no, no source of neutrons was available that could make enough plutonium to make an atomic bomb. But one of the amazing things about uh, the making of the atomic bomb is that there were a lot of things going on at science at the time. And one of the most coincidental things uh, marked the development of, uh, was, was sort of uh, involved in this particular story, which is that at the same time that Seaborg discovered plutonium-239 in his laboratory at Berkeley, California, the physicist, the physicist Enrico Fermi was working to build a, a, a device that came to be known as a nuclear reactor at at the time, he was at Columbia University in New York. Fermi was pretty much interested just in whether or not he could get a nuclear reactor to work. Uh, but as he studied the situation with nuclear reactors, he realized that one thing nuclear reactors produce is huge, huge quantities of neutrons. So when Seaborg discovered plutonium-239 early in the year 1941, Fermi and other scientists in the United States and really around the world realized that if a nuclear reactor could be, could be built and would work, it would generate more than enough neutrons to be able to convert uranium ore into plutonium ore with which you could make nuclear weapons. So uh, the very next year, uh, Fermi moved to the University of Chicago as part of the beginning stages of the Manhattan Project and built the world's first nuclear reactor under the stands of this a famous nuclear reactor built under the stands of a football field long since torn down at the University of Chicago. It was so secret at the time because of its connection to atomic bombs that no photograph was ever taken of this very first nuclear reactor. So this painting was made uh, later uh, based on recollections of people who were there at the time. So Fermi was, uh, of course, he was a scientist doing fundamental research as well. He really wanted to know whether a nuclear reactor could work. But the reason that this nuclear reactor got built at the University of Chicago was to see if much, much larger reactors could be used to build uh, nuclear weapons, could be used to make plutonium, and then use that plutonium to make nuclear weapons. So the uh, Fermi uh, first uh, 
started up this reactor and showed that it could work on December 2nd, 1942. And just about two weeks after that, here's this map that I showed you earlier, a colonel in the US, Car US Army Corps of Engineers was flying in a small plane. Uh, and his job was to try to find a place where he could, where he could site a facility uh, to build the nuclear reactors and other facilities that would be needed to make plutonium for atomic weapons. And he was flying up from the south and, and he recounts that as soon as he flew over the Horse Heaven Hills in this map and saw, saw this area that extends from Richland up to White Bluffs, he just knew that this was the perfect place. He said there was no place else in the, the United States that was like it that could actually provide for this. Uh, they needed cold water to cool the nuclear reactor and there was lots of that that was available from the Columbia River. They needed um, electricity, and it just so happened that Grand Coulee Dam had come online the year before, and some high-tension wires stretched right through the middle of this site between Grand Coulee Dam and Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River further down uh, between Washington and Oregon. So they could tap into that for the electricity that they would need to, uh, for the facilities. Uh, they needed this site to be far enough away from any large population center that if the reactors exploded or caught fire or had some sort of accident, which they were aware from the very beginning was a possibility, uh, that it would be far enough away that not too many people would be killed. Uh, at the time, this is 1942 when they're looking at this site, Richland, Hanford, and White Bluffs were small farming towns, each had about 250 people. Othello was the only town of any sizable uh, uh, population uh, 16 miles away from Hanford, and uh, I guess uh, <clears throat> the Fritz Mathias was the name of the colonel who had identified the site. I guess he either didn't see Othello or decided that it was uh, disposable in case there was a problem, uh, a problem with the reactors. So uh, the people in Richland, uh, Hanford, and White Bluffs were given eviction notices. They were given about uh, four, four weeks to eight weeks to move away and uh, abandon their farms and leave everything behind. Uh, the government paid them a pittance eventually for the land, for the property they gave up. And uh, the Manhattan Project uh, uh, started building the Hanford Nuclear Reservation to make plutonium. This is a photograph of the workers camp on the banks of the Columbia River. This is on the site of the old town of Hanford. Uh, within about, by 1943, about 50,000 people were living here in this construction camp. It was the fourth largest city in Washington state behind Seattle, Tacoma, and Spokane. By the way, this construction camp had completely disappeared by 1946. These workers came in here basically just to build these plants and then to leave and go elsewhere. And what they were working on is during World War II, three nuclear reactors were built along the banks of the Columbia River. This is the very first one that started out. It's called the B reactor. The other ones were called the D reactor and the F reactor. And the B reactor is, is not the largest building in this photograph. It's that sort of blocky building between the two water towers. The water towers held cooling water in case there was a loss of electricity or some other kind of accident the reactor. They could lower the, they could uh, <coughs> use the water in those towers uh, to try to, uh, to stop any problems with the reactor. Uh, this reactor is now part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, and you can actually go and visit it. I'd be, I'd be amazed if anyone in this group has, has been there. But uh, you can still go and walk into the face of this reactor. It was saved by a group of engineers uh, in the area who realized what an important facility was, what a real milestone in 21st century history it was. This is the face of the reactor where the uranium was loaded into uh, the reactor to be converted into plutonium. It, it's just incredible to me that, um, that, this, that this thing still exists. Uh, if you ever have a chance, it's, it's not an easy place to get to, but it is an amazing thing to see. It's uh, such, a, such a pivotal moment in the history of the 21st century. The other thing that people were building, uh, that the workers at Hanford were building, were th these gigantic facilities. Uh, these are essentially huge chemical separation plants. Uh, basically what happens is the way you make plutonium is you put uh, uranium into a reactor. Uh, the neutrons from the reactor convert some of the uranium atoms into plutonium atoms, but you need to separate the plutonium out from those uranium uh, atoms from the uranium fuel cells that you put into the reactor. 
before you can use the plutonium to make an atomic bomb. So uh, these gigantic buildings were constructed. Uh, the workers used to call them uh, uh, canyon buildings because they're, they're sort of big hollow canyon on the inside, or sometimes they call them Queen Marys because they're about the size of these big ocean liners in the middle of the desert. Essentially, you would take the fuel elements and put them in one end of this building, and then through a very elaborate chemical process, uh, a very small dribble of plutonium would come out the other end. And this had some other consequences that I'll mention in a minute uh, that are still being dealt with today. This was the plutonium that was uh, then sent to Los Alamos uh, where the bombs were constructed. Uh, as you know, there were two bombs built during World War II. The first bomb, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, used a rare isotope of uranium, uranium-235, that was uh, created in a, uh, manufactured in a gigantic plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, but uh, uh, the plutonium from Hanford was used in a bomb of a very different design. It is the design that we can have continued to use essentially for our bombs ever since then. This is a picture of the bomb that was uh, going to be dropped on Nagasaki, uh, being prepared to be loaded into the B-29 uh, that would that would head it up to Nagasaki three days after the, the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. In my book, I do describe the, um, the bombing of Nagasaki, and I try to recreate the experiences of, of what happened to people there. Here's a, here's a map of uh, Nagasaki that shows the process by which this bomb was dropped. Uh, it, it's an incredible story. Nagasaki sort of has two different sections of the city. There's a downtown, and the original intention was to drop the bomb on what's the identified in this map as the aiming point. The, the uh, B-29 was approaching Nagasaki from the southeast. However, due to a variety of mishaps, it's just amazing that this uh, mission to, to drop this bomb actually succeeded. Uh, they arrived, uh, by the time they arrived in Nagasaki, much later than they were supposed to arrive, the downtown had been, um, had been covered by clouds and they were under instructions only to do a, a visual drop of this bomb. They weren't to drop this bomb by radar because they had to make sure that this bomb, there was only one of them, it had to hit its target and had to do the maximum amount of damage possible according to the, the, the military commanders who were in charge of this, of this mission. In my book, I follow the experiences of a physician at the Nagasaki University Medical Hospital named Reisky, Reisky Shirabe, Dr. Shirabe. Here's a picture of Dr. Shirabe sitting in his desk at the, at the medical hospital. A picture of the, the mushroom cloud above Nagasaki uh, taken just a few minutes after the bomb was dropped. Uh, Dr. Shirabe was in his offices in the middle of the hospital, um, sort of in the middle of the cluster of buildings that are shown here. The hospital in Nagasaki was unusual for structures in Nagasaki in that it was built uh, out of reinforced concrete so that uh, it could withstand the earthquakes that often happen in Japan. And uh, that was what actually saved Dr. Shrabi's life, was that given where he was standing in the hospital, uh, the radiation from the bomb, which exploded above this valley about a half mile or so away from where he was, he was in his office, the radiation had to pass through several thick concrete walls before it reached him. As a result, it was diminished enough so that he didn't die of the radiation poisoning that killed many of the people who were in this hospital at the time. Uh, he did get quite sick with radiation sickness and just barely survived, but, but did survive and went on to spend decades actually studying uh, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the effects, the medical consequences of the bombing of Nagasaki on the, the people who lived there at the time. As I said, the, uh, the technology that was used in the Nagasaki bomb was so much superior to the technology used in the Hiroshima bomb that the design like the Hiroshima bomb was never really used again. It was really a technological one-off. All of our nuclear weapons today are built around essentially a very small version of the Nagasaki bomb. They're built around a core of plutonium about the size of your fist. That's about how much plutonium was in the Nagasaki bomb. To set off a nuclear weapon, you surround that plutonium with conventional explosives. You set them all off at the same time and you squeeze 
that core of plutonium so that it's about, about half the size that it started out at. And at that point, the plutonium is dense enough to trigger an atomic explosion. And that's what caused the devastation in Nagasaki. Today, the way it works in our nuclear weapons is that nuclear explosion generates the heat and pressure that's needed to ignite the hydrogen that surrounds the plutonium core in hydrogen bombs to generate a much larger explosion. Uh, the, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, even though it completely devastated the city, was very small by today's standards. The bombs you know, there's a, a, a nuclear weapons uh, submarine base just 20 miles northwest of me, right outside the window here at uh, Kitsap Naval Base um, on the Hood Canal here in Washington State. That's the West Coast base of the United States nuclear submarines. Those submarines um, carry a total of just a little fewer than 100 warheads. Each one of those warheads is essentially enough to destroy an entire city. If a, if a single bomb of that size were dropped on the city, uh, the, the city would essentially be destroyed. Anyway, so uh, after World War II, uh, when the United States uh, entered into the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, by the way, uh, was able to construct their own nuclear weapon in just four years, much quicker than was anticipated by US military and political leaders. They did it essentially by reconstructing the Hanford nuclear facility about a thousand miles east of Moscow, using blueprints and other information that had been stolen uh, through espionage from Hanford and from other sites. Uh, the bomb that the Soviet Union exploded in 1949 was essentially a replica of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Again, this was the easiest, fastest, and most powerful way to build nuclear weapons. So that was the one that the, that the Soviet Union did itself. So during the Cold War, the United States had a need for much more plutonium, and uh, so they continued to build nuclear reactors at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Eventually, there were nine nuclear reactors that were scattered up and down the Columbia River here. This is a photograph of what's called the N reactor, the reactor that's closest to us. The D reactor, I think, is the ones with the steam coming up from it, and the B reactor, the very first reactor that was ever built, you can see way back in the distance, there's sort of a black cloud of oily smoke, and that's, that's where the B reactor is located uh, in the Hanford facility. As I said, you needed to extract the plutonium from the uranium fuel elements in these gigantic chemical processing facilities. And one thing about doing that is that it's a chemical process, a chemical extraction process, and it generates huge quantities of extremely toxic and radioactive chemicals uh, in the process of, of uh, doing this extraction. And at the time in the Cold War, uh, the 1950s and 1960s, no one really knew what to do with these chemicals. They sort of figured out, they said, well, we've got a war to win and um, <clears throat> um, future generations will, will come up with some way of dealing with these chemicals. So what they did is they built 177 of these gigantic storage tanks in the desert. Here's, here are 12 of them. You can see that all of them are about the size of a high school gymnasium. I mean, these are gigantic. There are millions, many millions of gallons of these chemicals that are sitting in these tanks. They've now all been buried so that they're underneath the desert, underneath the sand of the desert. These tanks had design lifetimes of about 20 years. We know that many of these tanks have started to leak, that these radioactive elements have gotten into the ground beneath these tanks and have slowly made their way uh, down toward the water table. And once they reach the water table, they head toward the Columbia River. Uh, we are just starting right now, 75 years after the Manhattan Project began to put chemicals into these tanks to deal with the cleanup of these tanks. The Department of Energy is spent hundreds of billions of dollars and will spend hundreds of billions more uh, dealing with uh, the chemicals that are in these tanks. And uh, I mean, they'll spend much more money than was ever built on the construction and operation of Hanford uh, throughout its entire history. And this is a process that probably will take, de take decades to complete. Uh, Hanford is considered the most contaminated site in the Western hemisphere matched really in the Eastern Hemisphere only by the equivalent of Hanford that the Soviets built to produce the plutonium for their nuclear.
This is what the B reactor looks like today. As I said, it's now part of a national park. You can take a uh, bus out to, uh, to here to see the B reactor and see how it works. Uh, it, is a, it is an amazing place. Uh, and it's, it's really a way to sort of think about, um, think about not only what was done in World War II, uh, but the, the continuing legacy of these materials, the fact that uh, these nuclear weapons still exist, that they're a dire threat to human beings. They could really end human civilization in just a few hours if the weapons that we had were used against us or the Soviets were to use their weapons. Uh, it, it really is, a, it is an amazing place. And that's really the story that uh, I, I tried to tell uh, in writing this book. So that's what I have to say about it. I hope that uh, some questions have come up. Uh, I think Mark's going to come back on and see if there are any in the chat room. And if so, we can talk about it. Thank you, Mr. Olson. That was great. Um, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to picture a town of 250 people that uh, the government basically writes a check to and just said, you know, get out. It becomes 50,000 people. First of all, you know, what was the reaction? But I mean, I know it's not a large population, but what, what did they think of this and where did they go? Yeah, they were shocked. Uh, they, they were united in being appalled at the fact that this was happening to them. In fact, that group, the group of, of farmers and orchardists from that area held reunions for many, many decades. They're, they're finally, you know, they're, their sons and daughters are no longer interested in holding those reunions. But every year they would get together as close to their old farms and orchards as they could. Just remember uh, the, the, the decades, really, that they had spent in those areas and the, the process of being told, you know, they didn't even have time to really hardly gather their things before they had to get out of there and the government moved in and took over that, that property. But Colonel Matthias flew over that area on the very first day of winter in 1942. It was December 21st. Uh, the farms uh, looked pretty scraggly. There was nothing really growing down there. There were no leaves on the trees. And he thought, oh, there couldn't possibly be that many people who live here. Uh, it, it shouldn't be hard to be able to pay these uh, farmers and orchards off to move them out of the area. Um, obviously, you know, you talked about the fact that then the Soviets used this as a model. Um, it, um, how, how well known was Hanford as, as, a, as a nuclear research place in the 40s? Uh, obviously, the Soviets must have gotten, gotten spies in there. Were, were you able to identify the spy? Or, or, how, how did this become uncovered? I mean, what, what's yeah, the, their, their code names are known, but I, we, we don't really know the names of, uh, of the spies who were at Hanford, uh, although one or two have been identified in Soviet records, as Soviet records have become available. I mean, not only was Hanford not known at the time, it really wasn't very widely known in the 1960s and 1970s when I was growing up at Othello. My grandfather worked as a pipe fitter occasionally at Hanford. And when you worked at Hanford, you had to sign a contract before you began work that you would not tell anybody what it was you were doing there or what this facility was doing. You weren't even supposed to tell your family that. And my grandfather never did. We would say, gosh, what do you do over there? And he said, well, you know, I, I really can't tell you. And that was really quite common uh, among many families who grew up in the Tri-Cities, what's the area is called now the Tri-Cities. It's Richland, Kennewick, and Pasco are the three towns. Now they have almost 300,000 people altogether uh, that are just on the borders of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. And many of the people that grew up in those towns in the 50s, 60s, and 70s really had no idea uh, what, what their parents did out there at the facility. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons that that a book about Hanford, a popular book about Hanford, hadn't been written before. Because even though Hanford opened up in the 1980s when the cleanup began, when, there was, when we had no more need for plutonium, uh, there was still so much secrecy adhering to the site that uh, people sort of seemed reluctant to talk about it and didn't know a lot about it. Plus, it's in the middle of nowhere. That's certainly what I felt when I was growing up in this little small town that, uh, gosh, what, it just seemed like uh, I was living at the end of the world. What is the condition of it now? I mean, uh, um, as somebody write, is, isn't Hanford still the location where states send radioactive waste? Um, I mean, is it still leaking? What's, what's the condition of the Columbia River? 
Right. So what happened is that uh, by about 1980, uh, we realized, that the United States realized that we had more plutonium than we would ever need. At that time, we had 30 to 40,000 nuclear weapons, as did the Soviets. And uh, it was complete overkill. There was no possible way that we could use that many weapons. So since then, so at, at that point in the 1970s, and actually at the end of the 1960s, the reactors in Hanford started getting shut down, and as did the separation plans. And uh, ever since then, we've actually had more of a problem figuring out how to dispose of this excess plutonium that is in these nuclear weapons than we have uh, ha having enough supply of nuclear weapons. So in the 1970s, the mission at Hanford transitioned very gradually and very difficultly from the production of plutonium to cleaning up the facilities that were left behind. And it was not just what are called the tank waste, these extremely radioactive chemicals that are sitting in those 177 tanks, but the whole site was full of, oh, in some cases, not even very well identified uh, dump sites uh, where materials had been thrown. There were these tunnels that contained uh, railroad cars that were full of contaminated equipment contaminated carcasses of experimental animals. It was a mess. And the Department of Energy has been working really ever since 1980 in an effort to try to clean up this mess. There are you know, millions of people who live downriver, down the Columbia River from the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. And the Department of Energy really cannot afford to leave all those radioactive wastes in those tanks, have them start leaking into the Columbia River. They know they have to deal with this problem, but it is an immense problem. Now, They've made a, quite a bit of progress, actually. Uh, of the nine reactors, the B reactor is still open as a museum, but um, the, other, the other ones have been cocooned. They've had all of their external facilities removed and they're surrounded by concrete. And they have a heavy duty roof on top of it. They'll actually sit there in the desert. <clears throat> the plan is to let them sit there for 75 years while the radiation decays and the Department of Energy can then decide 75 years from now what they're gonna do with those plants. So a lot of the cleanup effort now has moved away from the old reactors to what's called the central plateau where those tank wastes are. That's also where a lot of the groundwater treatment facilities are because as these radioactive materials get into the groundwater, essentially what the Department of Energy has been doing is pumping that water up out of the ground, uh, out of the water table, treating it, getting the contaminants out of it and then pumping it back into the, into the water table. And you know, except for a couple of problems, a couple of plumes that have been difficult to deal with, that, that has been dealing with the problem so far, but it's really expensive and we're going to have to keep doing it for a long time. Um, has it been difficult to recruit construction force, uh, construction labor to, to the area? I mean, are, are, are people uh, willing, will, willing to go? <laughs> because of the contaminants. You know, that's a really interesting question. The, the short answer is no. Those jobs pay extremely well. The, the slightly longer answer is that uh, this area, the area around Richland, today called the Tri-Cities, has a long and sort of proud history of doing nuclear work. They're very proud of their role in creating the plutonium for World War II and the plutonium that was used uh, during the Cold War uh, to produce our nuclear weapons. Uh, just as an example, many people probably know that the Richland High School, the, the motto of the Richland High School is the bombers. They're called the bombers and their, their insignia is a mushroom cloud. It's a highly controversial, but, but that, uh, that high school has maintained uh, uh, that very controversial motto despite uh, lots of reaction against it. So no, the workers there uh, feel that they know the dangers posed by radiation. The companies that, uh, that are carrying out the cleanup uh, profess to be doing it in as safe a way as they can. There's always controversy over exactly how safe it is. There's continuing controversy, of course, about the extent to which people in the area, including the people in the town where I lived, have been exposed to radiation that was released into the air from you know, those, those reactors and those chemical separating plants all have these big smokestacks right next to them. And those were releasing volatile compounds into the atmosphere, many of which were radioactive and uh, would just fly downwind and be absorbed by uh, whoever was there. There was also a lot of radiation released into the water, right? Because you had to take 
cold water out of the Columbia River. You would pass it through the reactors to cool the reactors. And then that water was just pumped right back into the Columbia River. Oh, they'd give it an hour or two for, the, for the, some of the worst radioactivity to decay. But the levels of radioactivity in the Columbia River got to be rather high. Now, it's been difficult to conclusively demonstrate that widespread health effects occurred because of those radiation releases. And that remains still a point of controversy, the extent to which anyone can point at an illness that they have and say this was caused by radiation. My other grandfather worked as a farmer in, uh, in Othello. So he was out working the fields uh, just you know, 15 miles away from the reactor. He died of stomach cancer in his, his 70s. Uh, it's not an unusual um, uh, condition to, to develop at that time. But whenever you live close to the reactors, you say to themselves, gosh, even though there are lots of people who get stomach cancer all over the United States, uh, is my stomach cancer at all related to the fact that I live so close to those reactors? So, you know, I think all, all the people who work at Hanford, to return to your original question, sort of have to grapple with that <clears throat> decision themselves. And, and uh, figure out whether they're willing to take the risks that are involved in working. How healthy is the Columbia River now, um, you know, for the wildlife, the people, the, the fish and everything? And is nuclear waste still being shipped to, to Hanford? It, it, oh yeah, nuclear fine. waste still being shipped there. No, uh, nuclear waste wasn't. There was, a, there was a period where there was so much nuclear waste at Hanford that there was certainly discussion of the possibility of shipping extra nuclear waste to put there since the area was already contaminated. But no, that never happened in quantity. Uh, you know, there is an exception to that. Um, our nuclear submarines at the end of their lives have highly radioactive uh, nuclear reactors that they used um, to, uh, for propulsion. And those nuclear reactors are at this point taken out of our nuclear submarines and they're put on a barge and they're sent up the Columbia River and through the various locks to Hanford and they are being buried. Uh, you can, if you, if you go on a tour of Hanford today to see some of the waste facilities, you come to this site that is full of these gigantic cylinders and inside those cylinders are the nuclear reactors from our decommissioned nuclear submarines. And I don't know how many are sitting there, but it's a very bizarre site. They will eventually be covered by sand and uh, left to sit there in the desert. They're you know, completely isolated inside steel and concrete uh, <clears throat> uh, vessels. And uh, those vessels uh, supposedly will uh, keep the radioactive radioactivity from those uh, reactors from getting out. So that is, that is a case where nuclear materials are being shipped to Hanford, but it's not being used as a nuclear dump site, for instance. Uh, that's not happening. If you ask about the Columbia River, the, the operation of a nuclear reactor produces many, many different types of radioactive isotopes, and they have a very wide range of half-life. Some are dangerous for hundreds or thousands of years, and some are dangerous for just a few minutes or hours or days. One of the most troublesome isotopes that came out of the Hanford nuclear plant was iodine-131. Iodine-131 came up those stacks. It's, it's generated when you separate plutonium out from uranium and it's volatile. So you can't, you have to release it into the atmosphere. Uh, iodine-131 has a half-life of about seven days. So that means every seven days, the radiation in a given quantity of iodine-131 is reduced by half. And so the usual rule of thumb is that over the course of 10 half-life, so 70 days altogether, the radiation in that iodine is going to have to decay to the point where you really don't have to worry about it. Now, what happened with the radioactive iodine is that it went up the smokestacks, got into the atmosphere, was deposited on the ground and on crops and on uh, rangeland uh, downwind from the Hanford nuclear reactor. Uh, if those uh, crops or rangeland were being used to feed cows and especially dairy cows, the iodine would uh, go up the plants, uh, would, be, would be absorbed into the plants and the cows would eat it and the milk that they produced would be radioactive. So at that point it's sort of a race between the decay of the radioactive radioactivity in the iodine-131 and the consumption of that milk.
I remember when we were growing up in Othello, we had, we had milkmen back then who would bring this just incredibly tasty milk. Oh, I can still taste that, that milk. It must've had like 8% butterfat or something like that. I mean, it was just an incredible thing. Um, anyway, he would bring that, you know, twice a week and I'm sure it was from local dairies. Uh, so the question always would be, uh, to what extent was there radioactivity in that milk and did it do any damage? Because then once you drink that milk, the iodine-131 goes right to your thyroid and starts causing problems. And many people in the area do have th various kinds of thyroid diseases and thyroid cancer. Again, we don't know for sure the extent to which the thyroid disease suffered by people like my sister were caused by radioactivity. Thyroid disease and thyroid cancer are fairly common cancers and diseases, and it's very hard to know whether there is a higher incidence of those problems around Hanford than other places. So it's a, it's a controversial subject. But anyway, the, uh, getting back to the river, um, a lot of the radioactive elements that got into the river have since decayed. And the Columbia River at this point is quite safe. There is less radioactivity in the Columbia River from Hanford than there is from various upstream activities, especially the, uh, the mining, mining uh, uh, operations upstream in the Columbia River create much more radioactivity than does anything left over from Hanford. As a museum executive director, I'm trying to I'm trying to picture trying to be uh, in uh, a director at that museum. I just uh, that, that, that getting visitors could be a little bit tough. I don't know, but oh, um, I don't know. Lots lots of people go there. Lots. I mean, it's they're always sold out for the tours, and uh, which like is said, quite a popular place. What do I? Know? So, it's so <laughs> hard to get there, and you know, there's the, the 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 exhibits at that museum have sort of been set up by the engineers. Many of the engineers who worked at Hanford and were instrumental in saving the B reactor as this incredible historical site. And um, it probably needs a, a, a more professional hand to come in and work on the exhibits. These are such, such fraught topics that have to be described. The production of, of plutonium, the use of plutonium, not only in the Nagasaki bomb, but in all of the nuclear weapons that we still have today. The release of radioactivity and the, the plight of the downwinders in the surrounding areas. I mean, these are, these are difficult stories to tell. And you know, I, I, I try to get, get a start on that in my book, but um, there's lots of different elements. And there are people from Japan who come to uh, Hanford and uh, want to take a look at the reactor, including people from Nagasaki. I write about one in my book who came there and reflected on uh, the, the, the history of, of Hanford in the context of the bombing of Nagasaki. Um, how secretive was Hanford? Was it, somebody wrote, did, was it as secretive as Oak Ridge? And who was actually involved in the site? There's a couple of questions. Was, was, did Oppenheimer work there? Did Klaus Fuchs ever come there? Who, who was there? Who was it? And how secretive was this? Yeah, probably the most, you know, the most famous person who ever came there was Enrico Fermi. He was there to start up those nuclear reactors. After he built the reactor in Chicago, he oversaw the design of the reactors at the University of Chicago for the Hanford nuclear site. And he would come out uh, when new reactors got started up um, just to sort of troubleshoot. Actually, the very first reactor that was built at Hanford, the B reactor, almost did not work. Uh, the, the scientists had made a not, a, not a miscalculation. They had overlooked the possibility of something happening in the reactor. And if the reactor had been built to the specifications that they uh, originally provided, um, then that reactor would not have worked and we probably would not have had uh, enough plutonium for either the, the, the test of the plutonium bomb that occurred in New Mexico in July or for the Nagasaki bomb. However, uh, the, the, the company that was building that reactor, the DuPont company, had decided that they couldn't trust the scientists quite that much and they needed to build in a safety factor uh, if they were going to have confidence that this reactor would work. And in the end, it was only that safety factor. They had put extra tubes into the face of that reactor. You know, I showed them the face of the reactor where you put the, the uranium fuel elements into these tubes. Because they had built extra tubes into that reactor, they were over, able to overcome this problem that the scientists had overlooked when they were designing. Knowing that you were a local, um, and this is something, you know, a place you literally grew up by, um, how easy, tough was it for you to research this? Were they cooperative? I mean, were they receptive? I mean, uh, how long did it take you to do this book? 
Yeah, good question. I mean, technically, Hanford is now an open site, but as I said, some of the secrecy that surrounded the site throughout the Cold War still sort of adheres to the place. It's also so far away and so isolated that um, not a lot of people have have gone out there to do research, but there have been some. There have been various scholars who have written about Hanford and various activists who have tried to get information about the amount of radioactivity that was released from Hanford over time. So, um, so it's not as if I encountered any difficulties with uh, things still being classified, though there still is classified information, but it wasn't, it wasn't information that was necessarily critical to writing my book. It's, it's, fair, it's fairly open and was not difficult, other than the fact that you know, nobody had really written about it before. So it took me a long time to, to figure out how to tell this story and how to dig up the materials that I needed and then the people that I needed to be able to tell the story. But there's, you know, there's some wonderful work being done there uh, in association with the museum. Washington State University has a campus on, uh, in the Tri-Cities and they have something called the Hanford History Project, which is trying to compile as much information about Hanford as possible. Hanford is really a, a very important site, not only in the history of nuclear weapons, but really in 20th century history in general. And so there, there is a fair amount of attention that is being devoted now to trying to, um, to, to maintain some of the historical record that exists. Um, was Hanford the only place that was producing plutonium or, or, or were other places doing it? And it was during World War II. During the Cold War, the government decided that Hanford was too close to the Soviet Union, that it would be possible for Soviet bombers to come over the Arctic and reach Washington State and bomb Hanford and uh, destroy our one plutonium manufacturing uh, facility, which would essentially cripple uh, all the nuclear weapons that we had. So the government decided at that point to build a second facility in the 1950s to make plutonium. And that was put in in South Carolina. It was never as large as Hanford, but over the course of the Cold War, Hanford made about two thirds of our plutonium and the reactors and separation plants in South Carolina made about one third of, our, of, the, of the plutonium for the United States. We're not talking about a huge amount of plutonium, even though I show you those tanks with, um, that, are, that are full of those chemicals. The total amount of plutonium manufactured at Hanford could fit in the back of two pickup trucks. I mean, it's not, it's not a lot of material. And each of our, oh, I don't know, four or 5,000, at one point we had 30,000 nuclear weapons, each of those is built around one of these tiny plutonium pits. That is classified information, by the way, the size and exact dimensions of those pits. But, um, but, but they are very small. The original pit and the bomb dropped on Nagasaki uh, was a sphere that was about three inches across. Uh, technological improvements since then mean that our pits are probably smaller than that today. But still, we're not talking about a huge amount of material. It generates a lot of toxic uh, materials to produce plutonium, but, but the amount of plutonium produced is not large. Have the former employees been released from their silence requirements? That's an interesting question too. I actually do not know the answer to that. My grandfather's no longer alive, so I can't ask him if he was. I suspect there was no formal process by which they were released. But then plenty of people are more than willing to tell me what they did at Hanford, but they still have the old habits of, I mean, for decades, they worked under circumstances where they were told not uh, to say what they did at Hanford. And in some cases, their, uh, their, their fallback is still, yes, not, not to be that forthcoming about exactly what they did. Even though I, yeah, I don't think, they, I don't think they're prohibited from talking about it anymore. Okay. A January 20, uh, 2021 news report states the cost to clean up Hanford will be about 323 million to 607, uh, 323 to 677 billion. Does this sound correct? <laughs> that is correct. That is the current cost estimate. And uh, those costs extend well into the 21st century and possibly into the 22nd century. I mean, it is a huge, huge undertaking. Uh, to look at costs like that, you could say, it, people, people debate whether or not that cost might have been highballed 
market that it may not be quite that amount of money. Nevertheless, uh, it, it is a it is a, a gigantic expense uh, that we have. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, um, "Gosh, how how could they have done that? How could people in the 1950s have just assumed that future generations would would spend the money to clean up this mess as if you know they weren't going to deal with it themselves?" And my reaction tends to be, well, what are we doing with carbon dioxide? I mean, uh, you know, we're putting all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, assuming that future generations are going to pay and figure out a way to deal with that carbon dioxide. And that's a much, much worse problem than was the problem of putting these wastes into these tanks. Those tanks can be cleaned up. My son is an environmental engineer, and he tells me, you know, you can clean up almost anything if you put your mind to it. Uh, in this case, it's, you know, it's extremely expensive, but so far, the federal government has been willing to spend, oh, two to two and a half, three billion dollars a year on that cleanup operation. And there are points at which it's probably going to require even more than that per year, and that's a large amount of money. But so far, the federal government has been willing uh, to, to put the effort into, into, into trying to clean up that site so that people can use it. And so that that waste, so the waste don't get into the Columbia River. That's the most, that's the most important thing that has to be done. Is this an EPA uh, thing or is this a, a, or, a, or is this private? Who, who's doing the yeah, EPA, EPA is involved. They have a partnership with the state of Washington and with the Department of Energy. It's called the Tri-Party Agreement uh, to clean up Hanford. And the Tri-Party Agreement sort of lays out what needs to be done. Private contractors are then hired by the federal government and the Department of Energy to actually get the job done. And that's always a, a complicated process to supervise those, uh, the people who are doing that work and to, um, you know, to make sure that your money is being spent effectively. So, so how long did you work on this? How long did it take you to well, write? Gosh, you know, three or four years. But the fact is that I probably have been thinking about writing this book since, since the 1980s. Uh, when I first started writing in the 1980s, a science magazine in Washington, D.C. Uh, sent me to do a story on the decommissioning of the shipping port nuclear reactor. And you're right, that's another instance in which a radioactive waste from outside of the site was buried there because shipping port, the first commercial reactor in the United States, which was built on the banks of the Columbia River, when it was decommissioned, that nuclear reactor, which was radioactive, was also put on a barge and sent to the Hanford nuclear site to be, um, to be buried in the sand. So I went out to Hanford and I was driving around and I had never been on the site before, of course, even at that point, all of it was behind high barbed wire fences. It still is. I mean, you can't just wander onto the site today. It's a, it's a dangerous place. You have to be supervised whenever you're going anywhere on the site, including to the B reactor. But we were driving around. I was driving around the Department of Energy official, as I say in the book, and these gigantic concrete buildings are appearing on the horizon. They turned out to be those gigantic uh, canyon buildings, the Queen Mary's. I said, gosh, what are those things? Because they're immense. Um, and he said, oh, that's, that's where we made the plutonium for our nuclear bombs. And I said, well, that's incredible. That's got to be an amazing story. And so that was in 1983. So I've really been thinking about writing this book ever since then. And I've always sort of had a Hanford file back there. But really, I only got serious about this book in, in 2016 after I got done with my book about Mount St. Helens. I said, okay, now it's time to finally write that Hanford book. Well, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, this has been this has been great. The name of the book is The Apocalypse Factory. Um, thank you for joining us from Seattle. This has been amazing, and um, so good luck with this. Um, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight, and good luck with this book. Um, I hope to have you on on again with with something else. <laughs> thank you. I'd always be happy to do it. All right, all right. Thank you everybody. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.